All right, we are back for another rip roaring episode of the IBS Freedom Podcast. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about a vicious cycle that honestly, I, I think Amy, you're going to agree with me here, but I see this clinically all the time. And I'll tell you right now, this is going to be an episode that some of you might not want to hear. And I think that you should hear us out. You should listen to it anyway. But um, what vicious cycle are we going to be talking about today, Amy? Yeah, so we're going to be talking about the vicious cycle that happens when you have gut symptoms, how your how your brain responds to those symptoms. Usually it goes on high alert, especially if you've had really intense symptoms for a while. Your brain starts saying, oh, we don't want those symptoms. We want to protect you from those symptoms. And that leads to a lot of hypervigilance and being on high alert. And that usually leads to more gut symptoms. So it's yep. this vicious cycle of having the symptoms, being extra attuned, too attuned to the potential of symptoms, and that leads to more symptoms. So it's – another way to think about it is I, I think once you have had symptoms or almost like a PTSD-type response to symptoms – um you start getting fearful of the symptoms themselves and then that leads to more symptoms. So it's, it's really hard to get out of the cycle at times. Um, because again, you can be so habituated to being hypervigilant and hyper-focused on every change that's happening in the gut. Um, when you're in this sort of mental space, if that makes sense. Yeah. And that's such a good way to start us off because I think there's a difference between the symptoms themselves and the fear and the anxiety of the symptoms, right? And the two of them usually get clumped together in the same experience for people, Mm -hmm. right? Like they experience both at the same time. They will experience the pain or the bloating and they'll also experience the anxiety or like the concern or the worry over the symptoms they're currently experiencing. So I think that we naturally clump those together as the same entity, but they are two totally different things. And I, I think I've shared the story before, but I know I've met people who have pretty noteworthy symptoms and they don't give a rat's ass. (laughs) And then there are people who have very minor symptoms and they are 10 out of 10 freak the F out over it. But Mm. I'll never forget, I was in clinic when I was in chiropractic school. This is one that I think I've shared. But I remember this guy came in for a chiropractic adjustment. And me being the geek that I am, I was asking him some other questions like, how's your digestion? How's your sleep? And he very nonchalantly said, oh, yeah, I have diarrhea every day, like multiple times a day. And I was like, whoa, that's concerning. We should probably discuss that. And he's like, no, I'm just here for an adjustment. Like, okay, well, all right, right, you do you, man. Or like, I have friends, some of my dearest friends from undergrad and high school poop one time a week. I shit you not. They poop one massive turd a week. And that's it. And they know they're constipated. And I brought up the idea of like, hey, I could probably help you with that. And they're just like, oh, that's just how it is. But I've met people, if they poop every other day, Like if they skip a day between poops, they lose their shit, pun intended. Hmm. And it's like the end of the world, panic panic level midnight. Oh my God, I'm building up toxins in my gut. So again, like I think that there's a difference between experiencing the symptoms versus like kind of the mental hoops that we make ourselves jump through when we experience those symptoms. And that's what we're going to try to dissect a little bit today. Yeah, to me, it's it's how are you responding to those symptoms? And I think there's a habitual pattern that you can get caught in, but I do think that there's a lot you can do to help change some of the mental patterns that you're jumping in, that you're that you might more naturally jump into because you've been stuck there for a while. Um, I always think of um, it a little bit, you know, when you have discomfort. <sighs> In that moment, probably the best response is building some tolerance to that discomfort, at least in the moment, because probably right immediately there might not be a 
a huge amount that you can do, maybe like ginger tea or something. But, you know, if you're in an IBS recovery, you're going to have some symptoms and some discomfort. And the more that you can sort of accept and tolerate that discomfort, um, the easier I think progress can become, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. I think that that's what the, the, the brain is doing and, and what the hypervigilance is doing is like, oh, this is dangerous that you're having these symptoms. And in reality, I don't think it's outright dangerous. I think it's uncomfortable. And I, I, I don't want you personally uncomfortable. But I think the more that you can sort of um, Im- accept that dis- moment of discomfort and move forward, you're going to be at a much better place long term um, than feeling like you have to fix every single discomfort in your journey or that every discomfort equals danger and requires a lot of thinking and um, like ruminating about, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and I think um, that's a really valid point. I think that any sort of discomfort or pain or unwanted symptom, I think that our nervous system is perceiving that as danger. Right. And, you know, there's a threat and we need to protect you. And on the one hand, like, thank you, nervous system. We appreciate the effort to protect us. We do. However, you can chill just a little bit oftentimes. Um, Yeah, I I just think that's a good point. Well, and I think that the danger signaling definitely wants you to sink into that more. Like, oh, I have to solve this problem. I have to do something about this right here, right now. And again, I'm not saying that if you have a gut symptom, there there could be something you could do. If you have a little heartburn, take a little DGL or something, you know. But I think that there's an urgency that starts to trickle in with the hypervigilance where I have to keep focusing on it or keep checking my symptoms. And the more you focus on pain or discomfort, usually the bigger that pain and discomfort becomes. Um, and so... Yeah, it's so tricky. And I think it's really hard because like you said, the nervous system is doing its job to some degree. But if you're responding to that signaling and getting sucked in and sucked in to the danger signaling, it it can certainly be problematic long term um, and can kind of keep you really stuck on every change in the gut. And, And you can look at minor changes that can happen in your gut journey that are positive as negative. So maybe you're introducing some foods and you get some gas bubbles or you get, you get diarrhea, a little bit of diarrhea. And maybe it's because you just haven't had a potato in two years and you introduced a potato and that's totally normal. But when you get that danger signaling, it can sometimes make you think, whoa, I just don't tolerate potato. I, Mm -hmm. I can't deal with with that symptom. This is inflammatory. This is bad for me. This is hurting me. Yeah. So the hypervigilance can sometimes keep you very stuck inside your comfort zone because you're trying to avoid that danger. Um, Well, and that makes me think of an analogy I'll share. So I forget where I picked this up. It might have been in like a business coaching class or a functional. So I don't know. But there's this idea of um, there's a dog sitting up on a porch, just howling in pain. And you walk up to the dog to help it and you realize, oh, the dog is in pain because it's sitting on a nail. And you try to, you know, here, boy, here, come here. And you try to get the dog to get up off the nail, but the dog is so petrified that taking action is going to cause more pain that it doesn't move. And it just sits there yelping and howling in pain. And I think that the takeaway here is that oftentimes we are much more willing to deal with a familiar discomfort or pain because at least it's familiar and it's predictable versus taking a risk or taking action and risking potentially being in more pain. And in the idea, the analogy of the dog, yeah, if if the dog got up and got its body off of the nail, it probably would have an increase in acute pain, right? Like, or I'm picturing when I was a kid, I stepped on a nail, like a rusty old nail out in the back by the barn and filled my shoe with blood. It was great. It was a weird memory of my childhood. But, you know, it, 
It's like the dog getting up off the nail, causing an increased amount of pain in the couple of seconds that it's getting up. Does that mean that it was the wrong decision for that dog to get off the nail? Or that getting off Mm -hmm. of the nail is bad or inflammatory for that dog? No, it's just that sometimes with change, there is going to be a change in symptoms or potentially pain. And you kind of need to wrap your head around that. And we talked recently, I I did a live stream with some FODMAP Freedom alumni last night. And one of the recurring themes that a lot of them brought up is there's going to be some blips and some discomfort, and you just have to learn how to push through Mm -hmm. and how to understand your body enough that you could gauge what is a normal, okay level of discomfort or symptomology, because maybe you added a potato in for the first time in two years, or maybe you added in onion and garlic for the first time in two years or whatever it might be. So like you kind of need to know yourself enough or have somebody helping you with that process, I guess, where you can judge, okay, there were some symptoms, but do I need to freak out over these symptoms? Right? Yeah. And and I think too, the more that you can stop checking for symptoms is a really key thing here too. I mean, I, I know a lot of people that will do tracking of their symptoms. I think that there can be a real time and a place for that if it might be a really specific symptom um, that's newer or something that's like not well understood and with a particular type of person. But I think for a lot of people, tracking symptoms makes things so much worse because again, you start to, you start to become hypervigilant to every change, every twinge, or like you said, blip, that's a little bit different. Um, Make you think, "Uh Oh, like, did I eat the wrong thing? It like kicks off this, Uh, mental rumination a lot of times that I don't think is productive. Um, And and again, again, I think the more that you're paying attention to symptoms, the more you're going to find symptoms too. I I think about um, this analogy as well. Since I've had Cece, she's obsessed with planes. So now, like, I I hear planes now. I'm Mm. super vigilant to when I hear a plane because we'll always look at them. I swear, I never realized how many planes flew over because I was never looking for planes before. So it's so interesting that the brain can kind of change because now anytime I hear a plane, I'm like really vigilant to it because I'm trying to point it out to her. Well, you can be locked in that state of mind too with gut symptoms. Like anytime there's a change, if, if you're looking for symptoms, you can kind of flare up those symptoms and find yeah. more of those symptoms if you're if you have this wall up and you're extra vigilant um to changes. So that's another important thing too is checking on your gut like how's my gut doing today? How am I doing like checking on it that frequently and doing symptom tracking I think can be super counterproductive because again, it enforces this hypervigilance that can keep you stuck. Uh, it it oftentimes makes you see more symptoms. Um, and again, we want to pull you a little bit out of being as hypervigilant to symptoms and more focused in on your life and your goals and your values. Um, granted, again, sometimes you are going to have symptoms that you're going to feel and it's going to be uncomfortable. Um, But again, if you can respond uh, and sort of just accept the current moment when those symptoms come online and maybe you do some things to, you you process that and get curious about that reaction a little bit over time, but try not to hyperanalyze every uh, response. I think that you're going to be in a much better place. Yeah. Well, I think that there's a couple of layers here. There's A, it's worth saying that every single person on planet Earth has little blips and symptoms and stuff that mm-hmm. goes on, right? Like Very true. I get the occasional headache. I will have a day here that where I'm more constipated. I will, <laughs> I was talking about this on the panel last night. Um, I bought a bag of avocados from Costco and they all ripened on the same day. So I had like, six or seven avocados to eat all at once. And I made this giant bowl of guacamole 
And then my daughter didn't want any, and my husband only wanted a little bit. So I had this heaping bowl of guacamole to eat all at once. And I shared some with the neighbors, but I still ended up eating like four avocados worth of guacamole. No joke. Mm. And I realized that we had family movie night and we're sitting there watching the movie and I had the realization, oh, my tummy kind of hurts a bit and I feel really bloated. But immediately I was like, oh, well, (laughs) yeah, you ate four avocados (laughs) worth of guacamole in addition to whatever my dinner was that night, keep in mind. So yeah, duh, that was just an insane amount of all of, you know, one type of FODMAP and it's something I wouldn't eat that volume of normally. So, okay, whatever. I think that's, that's going to be the key word for this episode is whatever. Mm. The more you can embrace whatever, even just a little bit more in your life, I think it'll do, do you well. And I want to, I want to point something out though. There's something that has been floating in my brain this episode. Um, I think that a piece of this comes from a place of judgmentalness. And I think we should talk about that. Um, Realistically, we know our audience, right? So pretty much everybody who listens to our show, you have been focused on your health for quite some time. You have done at least one, if not numerous diets or cleanses or programs or protocols at this point. Like most of you have done a lot of different diets and Mm -hmm. protocols at this point. You are really really desperately trying to get your health on track in some way, shape or form. So you are not the normal standard American kind of people walking around. Like if I talked to 100 people out of our audience and our listenership, and compared them to 100 people just plucked off the street at Walmart or the gas station in my town, totally different groups of people. And that's important to note, because I think what can happen is people in the crunchy, healthy, lifestyle, nutrition, functional medicine kind of arena, and the people like the patients who are in that world, clinically, too, we could sometimes look at the other group of people and be like, Oh, how do they not know? Right? Like, how are they such idiots? And we wouldn't say it that way. But that's kind of what a lot of times is happening in our heads. And it's like, you see your uncle Carl demolish like three donuts for breakfast and then wash it down with a Coke. And you've got to admit that oftentimes there's that little voice in your head that's like, Oh my God, how does he not know what an idiot he or like you hang out with your diabetic, whoever. And again, they eat like a giant bowl of spaghetti for dinner and you're like, Oh, how do they not know? And so I think what happens too with the hypervigilance is that we are so desperate to not turn into that person, right? Like the person who's blissfully unaware, they have, they are not in tune with their body whatsoever. They are eating things that are blatantly affecting them and they have no freaking idea, right? We are so desperate to not turn into that that it's like the pendulum swings aggressively to the other direction hmm. and we turn into this like obsessive hypervigilant like biohacker orthorexic kind of version and like neither of these are healthy (laughs) yeah yeah i i agree and i I do think that judgmental is an interesting word um because again i i think that there's also just a desire to not have some like there's a deep-seated fear that they're going to be trapped again like I think that that's so prevalent how often do we talk to people and they say they say I'm worried I'm going to have symptoms forever like I feel like I've heard that from clients before um and again like that's if that's like the fear going through your head each time you're having a sit like a symptom of like oh man I'm going to have these symptoms forever and these things are confirming that, like each one of these little blips is confirming that, you just get so sucked into this mindset. But but I do think that if you're judging each piece as like, oh, it's confirmation that I'm just going to have these gut symptoms or it's confirmation that my gut's messed up, that can be really problematic too. Um, it's interesting, again, like you, you bring up 
the judgmental word, because that is something that in my research for my book, I'll have to pull it up because I think there was a quote from the article, but there was an article that was using mindset or mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, as a technique for IBS. Um, Let me pull it up because I had it pulled up before we started. Um, But essentially, uh, you know, they were doing some techniques. uh, They they had... um, the, the mind the strategies like mindfulness based stress reduction help your willingness to tolerate the uncomfortable symptoms so you can overcome your fear of symptoms. MBSR seems to help the IBS sufferer avoid catastrophic thinking and appraise the IBS symptoms as less threatening. So again, when you have the symptom, you don't view it as dangerous. You start to just kind of conceptualize like, well, I'm just having some symptoms. Yeah, I'm just gonna it, it kind is of, what it is. I'm just gonna let that be. Um, and this mindfulness based stress reduction technique. I think again, like it's similar to like a, a style of meditation. I, I, I'd have to pull it up to, to get exactly what they did. Um, I, maybe we can link to this article, but they did it for three months and it had a 71% respond responder rate, um, for IBS sufferers. And they said, um, this was a quote from that. It. it said anticipatory fear, worry, and shame regarding IBS symptoms are hallmark psychological issues in IBS and are important targets for psychological interventions. The cultivation of present moment awareness allows one to experience and intentionally respond to what is present rather than reacting automatically to thoughts, emotions, and internal sensations using conditioned patterns. This may cultivate a sense of confidence that one can stay in the present moment with unpleasant stimuli, thereby decrease the perceived threat. This ability may also serve as an exposure technique and may promote self-regulation and lessen the the tendency to focus on thoughts about future leading to worries and catastrophizing. Um, But it it brings me back to like the OCD when when it uses the exposure, when it uses exposure, because again, the, the more you ruminate about a symptom, the more your fear grows about a symptom so the more you can just tolerate that, hey, I, I'm having something uncomfortable, but I'm going to kind of move forward and try to get through my day. And again, maybe if if you have some things that generally help with symptoms, you could try that. But again, a, same thing, like don't try to don't try to judge it as something that's bigger than it is. The, the, the more that you treat it as something that you can tolerate even though it's uncomfortable, the the less uh, fear response you'll have to the symptom. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that you looped in the OCD thing, because I was thinking that earlier in the episode. And when you brought up the idea of exposure at, in that article, I, that made me think of it too. But, you know, with with OCD, we've talked about this before. It You become so fearful of the thing that you're OCD about it feels like the natural thing to do to avoid the thing, right? Like I I keep going back to the example you gave in those episodes of the girl who was afraid that she was going to stab her grandma. So it made logical sense for her to avoid knives and avoid sharp objects and avoid her grandma, because if she avoids those two things, she'll never have to run the risk of stabbing her grandma. But the more you do that, the more you avoid the knives and the grandma in this case, the more you're kind of reinforcing that loop. And it's like telling your nervous system, see, we can't be trusted around knives Mm -hmm. and grandma. We have to avoid them. We're doing this for our own good. Oh my God, what if you stab your grandma? And it just made her worse and worse and worse. And the ultimate therapy for her needs to be gradually exposing herself to her grandma and knives. Mm -hmm. And I think we talked about this, like you can't put that poor human being in a room with her grandma and a bunch of machetes on day one, like that would be cruel. So it's a matter of kind of pushing the limit and letting yourself be uncomfortable a bit without pushing it so hard that you make the poor person have a total meltdown. But I think we use the example in that instance, like maybe the first thing is having her look at pictures of knives Mm. or a picture of her grandma. And then maybe like a medium step could be to bring butter knives back into her apartment and have her do like a webcam date with her grandma. 
And then maybe another step is to have her get lunch with her grandma, but at a public place where they have plastic butter knives and she needs to cut something with a plastic butter knife. And then the ultimate therapy to overcome this would be to put her ass in a room with a whole ton of machetes and giant knives and sit her grandma right next to her. And then with every exposure, you're proving to your nervous system, hey, I can do this. It's actually going to be okay. Like that fear that feels really real is actually illogical and I can overcome this and I can do this. But, um, right. Yeah, like I, the, well, I was, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, yep. Oh, I was just going to say that the act of avoidance basically is facilitating the danger. <laughs> so like the act of avoiding foods makes your brain think, oh yeah, the food's dangerous. Well, think about it this way. Would, like, the average person, I know that there's little idiosyncrasies we all have, would an average person avoid, um, I'm trying to think of something really benign, would an average person avoid a butterfly? No. But could you see how the neurology would work out that, like, if you start avoiding butterflies and you start looking out for butterflies everywhere... Mm -hmm. Like you could almost trick yourself into thinking that butterflies are scary or harmful Mm -hmm. or out to get like, it's kind of that you take something that wasn't intrinsically gonna hurt you or like not, not as much as you think it will at least. And then you start avoiding it. And then it reinforces this idea that see, you wouldn't be avoiding it if it wasn't dangerous. So this is proving that it's dangerous. See, see, Mm -hmm. see, see. Well, and, and I, it, Another good example of this from like the health anxiety OCD space is a lot of people fall into the bracket of fearing like heart attacks. So like any thing that even is like, oh, I felt a flutter or something, or I felt a little heartburn or something could send someone with uh, health OCD down a Google rabbit hole, Googling symptoms, um, checking on their heart, checking their checking their pulse, checking, they're, they're doing all this checking. And again, it, they can start to think that they're actually having a heart attack um, because, oh, this one thing that they found online matched their symptom, but it could just be heartburn. <laughs> but yeah. again, I think if you're looking for, um, you're almost looking for some of those symptoms, like you said, it, it, it distorts reality a little bit. Um, well, I like the airplane thing you mentioned earlier in the episode. It's like you, you, you probably have this newfound awareness and it, you almost start to realize like, wow, there's planes everywhere in the right. world. And that's not really true. But because you're paying attention and you're looking for the airplanes, you kind of start to have that perception of reality after right. a while. Well, it's like I never noticed the planes before. So like I just uh, that there was no acknowledgement acknowledgments of that, and I think people before you'll talk to people about did you have when did your gut symptoms start? Maybe they if they started a couple of years ago. You could ask them what were things like before that. They said I don't know. Like I never paid attention to my gut because it wasn't like yeah. it didn't have as many symptoms, which makes sense to a certain degree. But yeah. you know at the same time, I think you can get sucked into paying attention too much. And, and what do you do if you feel like you are hypervigilant? Because again, I know I was hypervigilant at different points in my journey and it really affected progress. So, you know, we're just trying to help pro- help you move through some of these vicious cycles because I think, I know we've both seen a lot of progress happen if people can uh, move through some of the hyper hypervigilant patterns that they're falling into, like some of the checking and the Googling and, you know, some of this stuff where they're really hyper-focusing on symptoms. Um, so, you know, what can you do if you're in this particular situ- situation is something we can talk about I- as well. Maybe that's where we go from here. Yeah, I I think that's a good place to go. But I do, I have two kind of yeah, related things to share briefly first, and that'll probably frame the rest of the conversation anyway. Um, so first off, honestly, the people who didn't want to hear this, they probably hopped off the episode like right, 28 right. minutes ago anyway. <laughs> but 
on the off chance that there's still some people listening and they're like, oh, I don't know, like this, you, you, you guys sound like jerks. You don't get it. You don't get it. Um, I, I want to be clear, like, we're not saying this to be judgmental or to say like, oh, you kook, it's all in your head. It, it's not that. But again, it's what I've said on this podcast before. It's not all in your head, but what's in your head matters. And in my mind, it's just neurology. Like at the end of the day, it's just neurology and kind of picking apart this really cool thing that's running the show called the nervous system and understanding how the nervous system is wired and why it gets stuck in a rut sometimes. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's just neurology to me at least. And uh, there's a, a couple of things to think about here. There's a really interesting and underrated YouTube video. I refer to this thing all the time. It's 12 years old. I have it pulled up. The title, it's from the University of South Australia, and it's titled, Pain, Is It All Just in Your Mind? Professor Lorimer Mosley, University of South Australia. Again, it's a 12-year-old video, criminally underrated. It doesn't have enough views. But he talks about the neurology of chronic pain, or the neurology of pain, I should say. And it's very fascinating and very well done. And I'm going to give away probably the best part of the whole lecture, but um, this, again, this will kind of paint a picture a little bit. Um, so he tells this story and he's like, yeah, I was camping. I was out in the bush. He's, you know, Australia. He was out in the bush camping and he was walking from the campsite to, uh, like a lake or a river or something where he would go swimming. He's like, I've camped at this campsite a million times. I've walked this path to the Creek a million times. It was routine for him. And he's walking along and he felt something brush up against the side of his leg. And he didn't think anything of it because he's like, oh, it's just like a twig or something on the outside of my right leg, whatever. And he kept walking and he said, um, and I'm realizing now the story won't do well for people with a lot of anxiety and OCD actually, but we're, we're this deep, we're going to do it. He woke up two days later and he was the first ever survivor of, um, I forget what the snake was, but it was like some, some really venomous. poisonous snake. Yeah. yeah. Really, really venomous snake. And he was the first ever survivor of this snake bite. And it bit him on the outside of the leg. And he was he was totally unaware. Like he felt the sensation, but he was so detached from it. And he didn't even think about it because again, he was in this routine. He'd camped there a million gazillion times. It felt like a stick brushing up against his leg. He didn't even perceive it as painful. The interesting part comes next. So Way later, he was back at the campsite and he was walking to, you know, the creek or the whatever to swim. And he was talking to somebody and uh, he felt something on the outside of his leg. And he immediately, he's like reflexively, not in his control. It was not a conscious decision. This is important. This was not a conscious decision on his part. He felt something on the outside of his leg and he immediately felt searing pain shoot up his leg and he dropped to the ground and he's in agony 10 out of 10 pain and he's screaming in pain and I kid you not it was a damn stick that brushed up against his leg hmm. but he had such PTSD and the neurology the wiring of that PTSD was such that any little sensation that was even remotely similar to that experience and his nervous system went into holy shit, got to protect you mode. And he actually perceived pain and mm. had this like totally not conscious involuntary response to a sensation. But in actuality, that sensation should not have elicited pain. Like that was faulty. Well, I don't want to call it faulty neurology, but the nervous system incorrectly assumed that that was dangerous and incorrectly assumed that that was painful. Yeah, it was, it was again, it was like the nervous system being hypervigilant right. because he had been through something really genuinely traumatic and really genuinely painful before. Right. So um, anyway, he tells the story way better, but yeah, it's a really fantastic video. I refer to it all the time. I've watched it at least a dozen times. Um, but I wanted to frame that a is that we're really talking about neurology here. There's no judgment. It just, the, you know, the human brain is, is odd. It's, I think it was Buddha likened the human brain to a thousand monkeys on a leash. Right. And it's our job to figure out how to walk those monkeys every day. So, yeah. um, hope 
hopefully people aren't getting, you know, too defensive with this conversation. No. And again, I, the, this is all, again, from my standpoint, as someone that does have kind of a propensity to maybe hook into and respond uh, with some anxiety to things too, like, because I struggled with struggle with OCD at times in my life. It's like, oh yeah, I can hook in to and respond in a heightened state to a stimuli that uh, again, I, I I think in reality um, might not be dangerous. Again, I think the, the thing that Jenna always said too was, you know, OCD, like you can't really tell the difference between a, a hose and a snake. Like, it's like, because again, there's, there's the hypervigilance at play. And so I think from my standpoint is it's so, it's so challenging when you're, when you're wired, when you've been in that pattern, finding ways to get out of that pattern. I've seen it lead to so much progress with my clients. And I think that you're in the same boat. We just don't want you getting stuck and let your fear prevent you from moving forward because that's really what's at play. If your fear and anxiety is preventing you from adding new foods in, from doing the things that you enjoy, um, that's going to be really, really, it's going to hold you back. Like there, you're not really going to be able to move forward if you're stuck in your comfort zone because any change, uh, you know, is keeping you stuck or you're avoiding. Um, I don't even want sense. to call it a comfort zone though, honestly. Like, I think mm-hmm. people understand the idea of a comfort zone. But again, it it makes me think more of that dog in the nail. The dog's not comfortable. It's not a comfort zone per se. Right. But again, well, it's, it's comfortable with the pain. It's like comfortable yeah, with the well, current again, like, situation. More comfortable with the familiar pain as right. opposed to being terrified of the unfamiliar pain. But yeah, I just I don't want people to think that we're implying like, oh, what you're dealing with right now, that's your comfort zone. You're perfectly comfortable. You're fine. And that's tangentially related to the other point I wanted to make before we get into the well, what the heck do you do about it conversation. Um, I think that sometimes the conversation of quote unquote acceptance can be tricky to navigate because a lot of times people hear the word acceptance and they think, oh, so I should be happy that I have these symptoms or like I should just be okay with it. And I think, I, at least I, being somebody who's not trained in the mental health field, um, I don't think that's what acceptance is about. I think it's just a, a more of an attitude potentially of like, it is what it is. And mm-hmm. me freaking out about it and scrambling right now is not going to improve the situation. So I'm just going to live my life feeling this way until the feeling passes, right? So if it's bloating, like, okay, it that sucks. I don't like it. But I know that freaking out and scrambling right now is only going to make the situation worse. I'm going to try to go about my day despite the bloating. And I'm going to let my body do whatever it's trying to do here. And I, I just wanted. Yeah. I maybe should have pointed this out at the beginning of the episode because, again, yeah. all the really skeptical people <laughs> jumped ship long ago. Well, but. I, I think I could provide a little bit more on this just because it's something that's discussed a lot in the OCD health anxiety space. Like, for instance, the girl who we were talking about in the uh, anxiety who had the OCD with the knife and the grandma, like she's not just going to as- accept that she wants – she's not accepting that she wants to stab her grandma – She's accepting that she had a weird thought and she's accepting the thought, but she's not like building that into who she is or judging it or ruminating about it. Um, She's accepting, oh, I had a really weird thought. Like that was so bizarre. It is what it is. Right. It is what it is. I'm moving on. I think from a gut health perspective, it would be like, oh, I'm having a weird gut day. Um, And I'm going to kind of move on from that. It's not accepting that that you're sick forever. It's accepting the current symptom. It's it's accepting the current moment that you're in. Well, and again, I think or a willingness a willingness to tolerate the current situation is another yeah. way to think about it too. Yeah. Well, and again, I think also separating 
the actual symptom in your physical body versus whatever your nervous system is conjuring up as a consequence of that. Right. So again, like, does it bring up feelings of, oh, my God, this is going to be my life forever? Right. Oh, my God, I've already spent $20,000 going to all these doctors and nothing has worked and I have no answers. And oh, my God, does it bring up, you know, pangs of, of like guilt or shame? I wish I could be there for my kids more. Oh, I'm a sucky mom. Like, it's all of the mental bullshit and the mental right. hurdles that we make ourselves go through. And trying to separate that from the physical thing that's going on in your body is going to be so helpful. And the more you can get the swing of doing that, and the more you can kind of exercise that muscle, so to speak, and get good at doing that, the better off you're going to be, I think. Yeah, it's it's the narrative. It's like the, the symptom happens and what's the narrative that then is sparked in your yeah. brain. Uh. Well, and maybe a good way to frame this as an exercise for people is... If somebody was watching you from the outside, like somebody who does not know you, um, but for whatever reason, maybe they had the ability to tell that you had this symptom, right? Like say you were out on the, let's say you were at the store, you were grocery shopping and, you know, somebody else in the grocery store was able to see with x-ray vision, oh, that lady feels bloated, but they're not able to read your thoughts. They can't tell what's going on in here, like, how would that person describe the situation? Right? Like, they're not gonna, they don't have the ability to tell the whole story that's in your head. Because again, they can't read minds in this weird scenario I painted. But they could see you, they could see your actions, they could see your body language, they could see your facial expressions, they could hear what you verbally are saying. And they just in this weird universe, they just happen to know that you're dealing with this one symptom. And they have some weird like x-ray vision to be able to determine that. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe looking at it from a detached third party point of view, who again, importantly, cannot read minds, and kind of looking at the situation that way, that might help kind of separate the mental side of it versus the physical side of it. Yeah. And, and I think jumping into like solutions too, like having a lot of self-compassion. I know we've talked about that before. It can be huge for these types of situations, like acknowledging, you know, hey, I do struggle with some gut stuff. Um, and again, acknowledging that struggling is like a human, a part of the human existence and talk to yourself really nicely. I think something you could do. Um, I'm you know, doing I the think best I can. Right. Doing the best I can. Um, you know, giving yourself some words of encouragement, some um, words of comfort. Again, Kristen Neff's website can be great with some of these areas. So I think self-compassion could be a great tool. I think that, um, again, avoiding the checking, the symptom checking, I think is huge. I think the more that you can... Um, kind of, tr I will say checking is a, um, I, again, some people think it's a, it's a, it's something that's like automatic. I would say it's not. I think in the OCD space, they say checking. So like checking, for, mentally checking that you have, how's your gut symptoms today? Like trying to pull away from that level of checking, even if it's mental, even if you're not tracking, uh, with a piece of paper, pen and paper, like this is my symptoms today. Even if you're mentally checking, that can also be problematic. Um, so trying to avoid kind of ruminating about each symptom and checking and like for the symptoms. body scan idea, right? Like okay, checking your poop each day, like checking your right, checking your poop quality each day, each mm -hmm. and every day, that yeah. kind of stuff. The body scanning stuff, I think, is huge. Um, yeah. So. I can Good. I say something on that topic briefly, by the yeah. way? This is a little bit related to a recent episode that we did. I, once again, find myself blaming functional medicine for some of this. Because mm -hmm. if you think about it, oftentimes in functional medicine, the way that this comes up is that they'll have somebody do an elimination diet. And as they add foods in, one new food every three days or whatever it might be, the practitioner is telling you, okay, now pay attention, pay attention to your body. And these foods are potentially inflammatory. So you don't know how it's going to show up. Like, 
It could be that this one food causes your eye to twitch and another food might give you a mm-hmm. migraine and it, it's right. not going to happen until three days later or two days later and you have to be really vigilant. And like, so there's a lot of that that happens in functional medicine with elimination diets and just like on the internet in general, elimination diets kind of breed this. Um, but also, I remember I had a big problem with this going through school. Uh, so after grad school, I did my nutritional therapy practitioner certificate, um, which I thought was overall pretty good. I never really used the hands-on assessment tools that they taught. Um, frankly, I don't buy into a lot of it. But I vividly remember one of the things that they taught in that program that I immediately had a big problem with was this idea. And I, I forget what it's called, but there's a name for it. But this idea that you should take your pulse before and after your meal. And if your heart rate goes up by a certain amount after your meal, that means that you're having a reaction or a sensitivity or an allergy to that food and it's inflammatory and or it's like a histamine response or something. And there was something bad in that meal that you shouldn't eat. Instantly, when I heard this part of the curriculum, I was like, nope. No, that is a very slippery slope to send people on. And honestly, we have a whole episode titled free and cheap. I really like free and cheap tools that are accessible and you can use them and you don't have to pay an expert to get access to them. However, it is too easy to check your pulse. Like, you know what I mean? Like if you have somebody who is more prone to this, like, anxiety, OCD, hypervigilant kind of thing. It is just so freaking easy to take your pulse throughout Mm -hmm. the day and with every meal. And it's like, it's actually too easy and too accessible. And I wish that people wouldn't teach other human beings how to do this because A, I don't think it's valid. And B, like, it's just your your pulse is always there. It's always going to be tempting right. you. It's always going to be a reminder that like, ooh, I should be checking and seeing if my immune system is pissed at me right now. And it's... Right. Anyway, so I think that these worlds, like, unfortunately, our healthcare practitioners can breed this into our psyche without even realizing it and realizing how damaging this is. And then they wonder why people are getting stuck. Yeah, like the food fear scenario. Yeah. It's just fraught with functional medicines. Hands are all over <laughs> the food fear element and the hypervigilance that stems from that. Um, yeah. And, and uh, you know, I, I think one thing too, to think about when it comes to trying to sort of overcome this is like, maybe just lean a little bit more into um your values and sort of your goals and your interests and your hobbies, again, pleasure, joy, connection. I think the more that you can still do these things and not let the hypervigilance kind of take over and you avoiding different things, like basically, again, like when you are in a really hypervigilant state, I think the gut stuff starts to sort of consume your thoughts and your life and everything like that, if you can sort of um, still try to pursue your goals, hobbies, things that you enjoy, I mean, I think that that goes a really long way because it shows your nervous system, hey, like I have these symptoms, but I can still go and work on my career that I'm really passionate about, or I can spend some time with my kid. And maybe I have symptoms during that period of time. Maybe I am a little uncomfortable, but I still can can enjoy my child and I can still connect with them. So, you know, I I do think the more that you can hone in on the things that you enjoy and connect and you can connect to those things, uh, you know, it it does tell the nervous system you're safe. And so it's kind of the antithesis of what is going on from the nervous system's perspective when you're hyper in a hypervigilant state. Yeah. Well, and again, to go back to this idea that I presented that this is all just neurology at the end of the day, uh, think about uh, there's actually a term called sickness behavior. Mm. And usually um, this comes up a lot in animal studies because it, you know, like a mouse can't tell you that they feel sick. <laughs> you just have to observe and see if the mouse is acting weird. 
Um, so it comes up a lot in animal studies, but also it comes up a lot in like viral illness, like mm. flu. Um, so when you have the flu, as an example, you exhibit sickness behavior. You're exhausted. You don't want to do anything. Get like low energy, low motivation, uh, lethargic, everything kind of aches. And, and you're, it's just like blah feeling. 100% of that sickness behavior is because of your immune system trying to smoke out the virus. None mm. of that is because of the virus itself. So all mm. of the symptoms that we think of when we think of the flu or Rona or any of these other things, it's because of the immune response, not because of the virus itself, typically. Um, but if you think about the picture I just painted of sickness behavior, you're cooped up, you're not mm. engaging, you're not socializing, you're lethargic, low energy, you're not expending energy, you're not moving your body, you're not leaving the house, and you're just kind of keeping to yourself and you're just kind of like bummed out and bleh. Well, what can we do to promote health behavior and signal to your nervous system that you are healthy and that mm. you're safe? Well, try to do the opposite of sickness behavior, even if it takes a while for you to learn how to implement this. I, I'm not saying that you're going to go from like lethargic, blah, kind of bummed, kind of depressed, IBS, miserable kind of life. I'm not saying you're going to go from that to like running a marathon with a big stupid smile on your face overnight, <laughs> but you know, baby steps, get out and go for a five minute walk. And then maybe in a week or two, you turn it into a 10 minute walk. Maybe get on the phone with a friend or Marco Polo or text a friend and maybe eventually that will turn into a coffee date or a Costco date with said friend. But start making these baby steps to show your nervous system, hey, we are not exhibiting sickness behavior. Therefore, we are safe. We are healthy. We're cool. Yeah. And I think the nervous system will start to re un untangle this and rewire itself the more you do that. Yeah, it's it's a fake it till you make it yes. scenario. It, it really is. I think the more that you can prime the nervous system with behavior that makes it itself feel safe, the better. And again, it just makes life super way more enjoyable for you too. Like sometimes I'm oh, we I always find myself thinking like, oh well, it'll help the nervous system in these things, but it'll also just make life fun, you know? Yeah. You know, and, and like enjoyable too, which is like. I don't know. I, I want a very fun, enjoyable life. That should be a good, solid yeah. goal, right? Uh, well, um, yeah. I mean, the reality is none of us know how long we're going to be on planet mm -hmm. Earth. It's true. Right. And and that's something too, like your nervous system trying to keep you safe and you doing some of this stuff because you're concerned about your safety or your well-being. At, like at the end of the day, we just don't know. You can obsess over your health and have the world's healthiest, cleanest, sparkling clean diet and you could buy all the best supplements and you could have the best air purifier and whatever else. And then life on earth is weird. You could be struck by a meteor tomorrow and it's all for nothing. So, yeah. you know, by all means, try to take care of yourself, try to take care of your body, try to be healthy most of the time, but also like get out there and live your life because we don't know when it's going to end. None of us do. And weird shit happens all the time and you've got to live your life while you can. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, and and um, you know, uh, I I think a couple other things to mention too. You know, I always think of the food fear scenario. You know, the general trend I see is the more avoidance and food fury behavior, the worse someone gets. I think if the restrictions and the avoidance were really truly going to help symptoms profoundly, you'd see the opposite, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. And I think if you're really struggling with food fears or some of these other, um, you know, hypervigilance type behaviors, it also might be worthwhile to, to talk with a mental health provider as well. Um, especially if you're, again, feeling like some of these some of the anxieties you're having around food is really limiting your nutrition. I, I mean, I think that that can start getting serious too, because if nutrition is subpar, it's going to affect every aspect of your health and it could make your mental health worse and keep you stuck in a hypervigilant state as well. Um, 
so again, it it's something too that I do think a lot of people could gain some benefit from getting some professional help to if they're struggling to overcome these issues on their own. Um, then the other thing too is I do think that a lot of general strategies for the brain gut axis, like you know, meditation, I talked about mindfulness-based stress reduction, hypnosis, I think they naturally just help with some of the fear centers in your brain. They kind of tame the fear response a bit, which I think makes you a lot more resilient for when these thoughts and fears come up. Um, so, you know, I think working on your nervous system as a whole could potentially help. It seems like um, like the mindfulness-based stress reduction seemed like it helped reduce symptoms and helped a lot with quality of life. Um, so I'd imagine that working on some of the nervous system pieces could also help uh, just with kind of the fear response, if that makes sense, um, and make you more resilient to when those those fears come up. I don't think they take the fear away, but it it can help you when it comes to if you hook into those fears or you don't hook into those fears. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that's a good point. Um, and I just looked up while you were talking, by the way. So um, some of you will remember we had a guest back at the end of season one, Emma from Therapy in a Nutshell was on our show. And she's just a wealth of information, but she has a really great YouTube channel called Therapy in a Nutshell. And some of her recent videos are kind of related to this ball mm. of wax that we're talking about. So for example, some of her recent episodes or videos, um, she has how to be less emotionally reactive. Mm. I, I don't, I don't know if that would be quite the same as what we're talking about. Um, how to do mindfulness the right way, how to stop worrying, but actually <laughs> stop overthinking, how to stop anxiety about anxiety. Like, are you anxious because you're anxious and that makes you more anxious? Um, how to deal with automatic negative thoughts. Um, there's just a really good library of free content on YouTube for those mm. of you who want to check that out. But if you're sitting there thinking, okay, cool, man, uh, this was a rad episode, but like, I don't know how to implement it myself. Again, I think that working with a mental health provider and helping kind of tease this apart a little bit and talking about it with, you know, a fresh pair of ears, a fresh pair of eyes, like that could be really helpful. Um, but also, again, there's hundreds of really great, great content on Therapy in a Nutshell's uh, YouTube channel. So check she, those out. And that and might help you unwind some of this too. It's a good, it's a really good suggestion. They might have a health anxiety course too, that I don't think would be over, overly expensive. No, her, um, her courses are very reasonable. I know she, she had an OCD course that I enjoyed and it, she, the, the lady that did the OCD course, I think did the health anxiety course. Okay. Because really health anxiety and OCD are kind of interchangeable at this point, like e even in the um, the medical field is uh, there is they interchange those terms now. Um, so, again, uh, that could also be an option to because um, her the OCD course was a good introduction and gave me some good tools to initially work on. I ended up going to a therapist um, so, but it did help give me some things to do until I could see a therapist. Yeah. And so, it at least gave you some tools and an initial framework to go off of. Yeah. And I, th I think some people just might need a little bit of a framework. They might need, not need the full therapy or anything like that. Some people might just need, um, a little bit of extra support to be like, oh yeah, maybe I should relax kind of how often I'm checking or Googling and kind of pull back a little bit. And that starts mm -hmm. the process of some of the change in um, like the, the brain chemistry a little bit. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't think everybody needs this intensive type approach, but um, you know, there's a spectrum. So you might be someone that might need a little bit more support and someone that just needs a reminder that, 
you know, the more that you can sort of uh, be willing to have the symptom in the moment and move forward with your goals, um, the better. And so just having that reminder might be helpful. But yeah, uh, I'm glad you brought up Emma's site because I think she has a lot of good free information and, and some other like fairly cheap options too. Yeah. Yeah, she's got some really great content. And like we we did an episode early in season two with uh, Jenna Overbaugh, who specializes in OCD, and she's got some great content online as well. Um, I know her primary platform, I think, is more Instagram, right? Yeah. Not so much YouTube, she's so got you can a find lot her on some, Instagram. She's got some online programming. She's got a lot of workshoppy type things that I think could be really valuable, too. The other lady, there's a couple other accounts that I like. I know we've talked about like Anxiety Josh is pretty good. He doesn't post quite as much as far as I can remember. Maybe he's out of my algorithm. Um, but The Anxious Truth is good. One that I really like just because I think she's really good about um, using metaphors that really hit is The Anxiety Paradox. I was trying to, I tried to reach out to her to get her on the show because I think she, and she's really funny. Um she, but I never heard back from her. Maybe you can reach out to her. But uh, she, she's the one who, uh, she, she has a video. It cracks me up. I think I sent it to you. It was like a bag for anxiety, and she was pulling out, you know, like, uh, you know, a stress ball. Oh, that's not working. And she's like, the she pulls out, you know, maybe a piece of lavender or something. She's like, that's not working. Like she's pulling out all these things for anxiety. And then at the end she pulls out like this little ball and she says, yes, the fuck it. <laughs> this is my fuck it. You know? Yep. Um, yeah. Well, and that I said that what it 20 minutes into the episode, I said, yeah. whatever, like the yeah. more you can embrace whatever and the more you can embrace living your life despite any unwanted symptoms. And, and again, like, it is what it is. That's another kind of way to frame this mentally. Um, again, we're not saying that you enjoy the symptoms. We're not saying that you want to have them anymore. We're not saying that you should do nothing about them and take no action. But again, I think my biggest takeaway from this episode is how valuable it is to learn how to separate the actual physical symptom from the cacophony of stuff that your nervous system is Mm. conjuring up because of that physical symptom, right? Separating those two things and being able to examine them separately and gradually working on the dare I say mental side of it is going to be really valuable for a lot of folks. And frankly, I think that this is the reason why some of you are stuck. And, you know, if you've got this stuff going on, there's not going to be a probiotic on planet Earth that's going to cure you of IBS. Mm. Just it that that's how big this is. So I hope that you guys enjoyed the episode and took a lot away from it. Uh, as always, feel free to comment if you're watching this on YouTube. And we will see you right before you know it for another episode of the IBS Freedom Podcast. Toodaloo.